five. Could we have the roll call by the town clerk, please? Chairman Swift Hayata. Here. Councilor Backer. Here. Councilor Frick. Here. Councilor Lynch. Here. Councilor McKenney. Present. Councilor Mole. Here. Councilor Roberts. Present. And the town manager? I'm here. And town clerk? Here. Okay, the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have some minutes in our package from previous meetings. Do I hear a motion? I move uh, approval of the uh, minutes um, of uh, 160405, 170405, and 180405. Thank you. Is there a second? I second the motion. Okay. Are there any? Um, Amendments or corrections or discussion? I have one item on the minutes for um, Wednesday, April 13th, which was the special meeting number 17th. Um, on item number 152, uh, I think that perhaps just as a clarification, because I wasn't quite sure at first, it, the second um, motion down, it says ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council approves the following. Um, perhaps we should just amend it to say approves the following 150, what was it, 53 through 158, because the actual vote 7-0 comes after 158, and somehow when I was first reading it, it looked like it went just with 158. So is that... Okay, we just set that as a friendly amendment. Okay. I can't rem remember who seconded it. I did. Is that all right? That sounds good. Okay. Um, any other discussion or comments? All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Reports and correspondence. Any counselors have anything that they would like to <coughs> add? Councilor Fritz. Oh, yeah, I'd just like to um, make particular note of um, something that the Recycling Committee at Regional Waste Systems has worked on for quite some time, trying to research how to get um, more weight into our recycling bins, uh, and particularly in the paper uh, category. And um, there was an article in, in the Courier that just came out, but I'd just like to encourage people to really take um, note of being able to put cardboard like cereal boxes um, and heavier weight paper in with your newspapers, magazines, junk mail. All the paper can go into one container now. And um, it, it really is easier for people to sort out their um, recyclables at home. Uh, is one of the reasons they will be doing it. And also that we spend a lot of money um, hauling the recycling bins. The town of Cape Elizabeth actually puts that bill. And the heavier we can get those recycling containers before they're hauled, uh, the less we pay overall for, for transporting. So I think this is, and the less air we have in, in the bin. Um, this is, I think, going to save us a lot of money. Uh, recycling, uh, the, the money, the revenue that RWS gets from recycling right now um, is really substantial. It's way, way over what we uh, have budgeted. And so I'd really like to encourage people to recycle all the paper that they can and also that we can recycle any kind of container that has a one or two on the plastic container. Um, which is really new. I mean, before you had to have kind of a narrow net, but now you can anything that says one or two, except for motor, motor oil containers. Um, so if there's any, I guess the, the bottom line is, if anybody is um, out there saying recycling doesn't pay, it really is paying now. Um, it is a cyclical kind of thing, but 
um, recycling really does pay in with some, with some space. Magazines, yes, magazines and catalogs and every, every bit of paper that you come into your home, you can recycle. Great, thank you. Anything else? I have a couple of things. I just wanted to report that as seems to be our usual success rate, the town council spelling bee team went down not to completely ignominious <laughs> defeat, but we, we lasted through about halfway through our round, and I'd like to thank Councillor Lynch and Councillor Moles for their expertise. And amongst the three of us, we managed to spell a couple of words right. I always pray that we're not the first team out. And yeah. once again, we were not the first team out. So for that, I'm grateful. We lasted longer this year than last yeah. year. We, we were during a round when I will note that every team misspelled the word dumbbell. So. <laughs> We were all dumbbells. It was, it was pretty sad, but, but I was getting to that. But <laughs> the team that prevailed in the end was the Rotary of South Portland Cape Elizabeth team. <laughs> and I want to congratulate them. And I also want to congratulate the Education Foundation because they did a really good job, as usual, on the spelling bee. And um, I want to thank them for the efforts. They, can, they uh, contribute a lot to uh, the community into the school system and um, I want to just wish them well and thank them and pray that there's some other counselors who would like to be on this team next year so maybe they'll do better uh, that was one announcement the second announcement is that we have a Spurwink church uh, study committee that is in the process of being formed will be get, will be meeting soon and um, the two counselor members of that group are going to be Councillor Fritz and Councillor McKenney, and I thank them for their um, work in advance on that committee to decide what the future will be of the Berwick Church. Uh, I also want to just update the council that at four, uh, we have scheduled for Wednesday at four o'clock this week uh, a meeting of the working group that has to do with the land disposition policy. Um, so things are moving along on that, and the working group will be bringing something back, I hope, in June to the council. So. Um, and lastly, I just want to give the counselors a, head up, a heads up that we um, need to, uh, at the end of this meeting, just get out our calendars and figure out some alternative dates for um, our October meetings and perhaps the July meetings. So just be aware. Okay, thank you. There is a council workshop also on Wednesday night, um, and the, thank you. <laughs> I just feel like the, I feel like he's a ventriloquist. It's on the retirement system, um, a review of the Repi main state retirement system, and on an update on town council goals. So, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and now the town manager can actually speak, not through me, but for himself, and give the town manager's report on financial benchmarks. Yeah, I, you can see there's a beautiful PowerPoint projector showed up with a blinking, uh, set up with a blinking red light, whatever that means, other than the fact that nothing is projecting. So I apologize for that. Uh, every year the, the council asks for us to do a benchmark uh, study, and particularly looking at financial benchmarks compared to uh, nine other communities in the area, the Cumberland, Falmouth, Yarmouth, Freeport, uh, Wyndham, Gorham, South Portland, uh, Cape itself. Uh, I say Freeport and Brunswick. But anyway, we, we look at those 10 communities and we look at where we compare to other communities. And, you know, just a few highlights. You know, sometimes folks get the impression Cape Elizabeth is a big spending community. And I, you know, this, this report shows that just isn't the truth. Uh, and uh, if, if you look at it, and I'll just highlight a few of the things we looked at, a few of the benchmarks. Full value tax rate. Cape Elizabeth is 10th out of 10. Spending on public safety per capita, 10th out of 10. Spending on public works and refuge disposal, 10th out of 10. Spending on fire and rescue, 10th out of 10. Uh, public safety overall, 9th out, out of 10. School administration, 8th out of 10. General government financial on the, on the town side, 9th out of 10. 
police department, eight out of ten. Uh, school operations, ninth out of ten. Uh, education uh, in and of itself, seventh out of ninth. Uh, debt service for school as a percentage of expenditure, seventh out of ten. Uh, library, sixth out of ten. Uh, cost per student, sixth out of ninth. Uh, you know, I, I haven't. The only areas where we where we tend to spend more than the average are uh, parks and community programs, and that relates to. Uh, the pool and fitness center and community services, Fort Williams, school grounds, and, and the rest of it. Uh, and we, we tend to be a little bit higher on uh, dispatch, but mainly because we're not spreading costs over over as, as many different individuals. But when you look at all these benchmarks, you know, overall it shows taxes in Cape Elizabeth are much lower. And I think, I know it was discussed a little bit uh, during the uh, the meetings with the school board, but I think one statistic is really important to cite. Instruction as a percentage of school expenditures. They're first out of 10, which means if you look at the whole school budget, uh, they're spending, they're devoting their dollars to instruction and not to administration, not to operations, not to transportation uh, and, and debt service. Their primary focus is the individual instruction. So you know, I, I think overall, uh, you know, this results in a lot of folks working cooperatively together. Uh, the Cape Elizabeth citizens uh, get a, a reasonably good bargain for their taxes, and uh, all the numbers, uh, you know, very. This is available at, at CapeElizabeth.com. Uh, you, you you put search benchmarks as uh, Wendy Durswick, uh, webmaster, has uh, put the report there for folks to see. And there's also copies of the available here in the office, but uh, it shows Cape Elizabeth uh, really does well uh, when we benchmark our financial uh, statistics against other uh, communities we generally compare ourselves to. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, t every evening, every town council meeting, we have two periods for citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda, so if there is, this is the first of those periods, if there is any citizen who would like to come forward and speak on any topic that is not on the agenda tonight, um, please come to the podium. And I see no one rising, so I think we're done with that. And so we will move on to item number 160.0405, which has to do with the municipal school community services and county budget. Well, you recognize the finance chairman. Yes. I just want to, so David doesn't have to take responsibility for it. Uh, Ian called me today and said, you know, Mike, one of the columns in one of uh, the spreadsheets just doesn't add up. Uh, and, and actually, that was the, the truth, that one of the columns <laughs> didn't add up. Uh, if you look at, it doesn't have any effect on the tax rate, and it's, a, it's my error. If you look at the FY 2006 budget, the net to taxes, and this is the revised sheet you have in front of you, 20,662,908 is the correct amount. The earlier one did not include the 248,300. Fortunately, all of the tax rate calculations were done on the basis of the higher amount. All of the percentage changes uh, and the dollar increases were done on the, per the percentage of the higher amount. So when, when the finance chairman presents perhaps the, the motion for this, uh, there's actually a sheet in front of you and there's ones out back too that have the revised number. It has no impact on the tax rate because it was anticipated. It just didn't show up on that spreadsheet uh, in the correct spot. I the other responsibility for that. Thank you. You're welcome. I will turn to our finance committee chair. And of course, all of the rest of the counselors picked up on that <laughs> discrepancy. We just didn't want to say anything. We wanted to see if Councilor Swift Kayata would notice it also. <laughs> we were testing you. I know. So she passed. She said. <laughs> um, I move that the council adopt as its fiscal year 2006 budget um, a budget with gross expenditures 
of $27,354,387. Gross revenues of $6,939,779. And with the amount of $20,662,980. $662,908 to be raised from taxation, all as further detailed um, as presented in our amended agenda. Thank second. you. I'm sorry, I seconded. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Council Fritz. Do we need to include in there about the fixing of the dates for when taxes are due? That's considered to be passed. Oh, okay. okay. Just for the, the public who may be watching, we have about two, uh, three, three and a half pages of text here um, that we are not going to read out loud to you, but um, according to Councilor Backer's motion, all that that is in those three and a half pages will be included as part of the motion. And also, um, so that people understand that according to the new um, essential program, the, the new, I'm sorry, LD1 rule that came um, into effect when the state legislature amended the, their funding policies, uh, we have to, we are required to put some of these paragraphs in here so that it is clear what we are doing and not doing and so everything's legally correct. So it's, it's all, I'm sh I presume, online if people want to read it and there are copies here in this room if people want to read it. If you go to the tab to the agenda, uh, we can write to it. Okay, thank you. So it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> Councilor Backer. Um, yeah, before we start on it, I'd like to make a couple comments, if I may. Um, this has been an interesting process um, over the last, going back to really the first week in January, when the council sort of kicked off the, the budget season with its um, initial workshop with the school board, which we held on January 4. And the school board at that time made a suggestion to us, which I thought was a very good one, and that was that we depart from our past tradition and not hold the tonight's vote on the same night that we held our public hearing on the budget. And this year we did, um, at the school board's suggestion, separate the two. And again, I still think that that was a good idea to do. The idea behind that was twofold. I mean, I think it was one to give us as counselors um, additional time to be able to reflect on the comments that the public made at the public hearing. And our public hearing was two weeks ago. Um, and second, to give the public further opportunity to provide the council with input on the budget. Um, and so we have had an additional two weeks since our public hearing for uh, members of the public to contact us and provide us with input. At our public hearing, um, unfortunately, we only had two people speak, um, one of whom really asked a question rather than providing us with input or comment, and the other person who did provide us with input and <laughs> questioned whether the council might have, over, might have overreacted in its September resolution whereby individual counselors uh, pledged or resolved to limit spending to an amount not to exceed the increase in the consumer price index. Um, since the public hearing, I think we as a council have received three emails from members of the public. Um, also questioning whether it was appropriate for us to have um, pledged the resolution as we did to limit spending to an amount not to exceed the increase in the CPI, and also encouraging us to 
invite public input on that resolution. And what I want to address tonight is that notion that somehow we haven't sought public input. Um, although there may not have been a formal public hearing before the resolution uh, was approved, it was publicized, there was an opportunity for input. Um, since then, on January 24, the council and the school board held a joint public forum that was very widely advertised. And in order to encourage broad participation and permit as many people as possible to provide us with input at that public forum, we actually held two sessions, an afternoon session and an evening session. Um, it was publicized. I think the school board did a good job of getting word out to parents in the various schools that the public forum was being held. And people were encouraged to provide us with any form of input at all that they wanted to give us early on in the process as to the process itself, comments on, the munici on municipal spending, on school spending, um, or on our resolution to limit increases in spending to an amount not to exceed the CPI. At the first of our public sessions, the afternoon session, we had two people speak. On the evening session, no one came. So we have had very little input, although we have done our best to provide opportunity to beg for input on this issue at the two public forums uh, held back in January, at the public hearing on the budget held two weeks ago. Um, people know how to find the members of the town council and provide us with input. It's one click on the website and they get all of it. Um, so the, it's not as if we haven't sought input. Um, we have asked for it. Um, we just haven't received much. Um, with literally a handful of exceptions, the response to our resolution has been a resounding silence. So I personally don't take, don't receive the half dozen comments that we have received, although I welcome them as a groundswell of opposition uh, throughout the town to the direction that the council has taken with the resolution, uh, the proposal to limit spending. Um, in fact, to the contrary, um, when you look at the flip side, at the um, 1,800 and some odd votes that were cast for the Pulaski tax cap initiative last November, which by our own calculation would have mandated a cut of over three, a cut of $3 million in the school budget and $1.3 million in the municipal budget, um, I sense that we're headed in the right direction with the budget as, as we have in front of us. Um, the only other comment that I want to make is the notion, uh, there was actually a suggestion made that by our current budget, we have hamstrung the school department in its ability to comply with the state's mandate of essential programs and services. But as I understand the numbers as presented to us, um, both in our packet and as presented to us during our uh, session with the school board to review their budget, the actual amount required for Cape Elizabeth to meet the state's essential programs and services is $14.1 million. The budget that we're being asked to approve tonight um, includes a school budget of $17.5 million, almost $3.5 million more than the state's EPS model. And I, I sense that some of the comment that we're receiving is out of a misunderstanding of the overall budget and some of the underlying requirements. And that's the only reason why I, I want to mention those. Um, I know we're not the highest spending community of our peers as our town manager just uh, highlighted for us um, with the benchmarks. Um, we don't spend a lot of money, yet we have great services 
our schools are among the highest, if not the highest performing public school in the state. And we have a lot to be proud of for that. We have a lot to be grateful for and thankful for, for our school department, uh, for our school board, uh, for all of our teachers, and for the parents who permit us to have such high performing schools. So we can always spend more. Um, that I understand. I think that's easy. Uh, but that's not our job to say yes to every expenditure that's requested of us. Um, and I just don't want to lose sight of the fact that I keep seeing, and we all keep seeing over and over again, the fact that we as Maine residents are living in the single highest or perhaps the second highest, depending upon which study you happen to read, tax burdened state in the country. And that's not merely an issue of taxes out of Augusta, that's the overall tax burden, which includes the local tax burden, which means the property tax rate, which means the tax burden set by the seven of us sitting up here, nobody else. Um, and to the extent that we read that we are the highest tax burden citizens in the country, and we look at each other and shake our heads and wonder how that happened. This is an opportunity for us to recognize that we are part of why we are living in the highest tax burden state in the country. Um, sure, I'd love to live in a community where our teachers made two times more than they do and where all of the municipal departments had all the money they needed for whatever they wanted. But um, I think everybody recognizes the difference between getting what you want and getting what you need. Um, and my sense is that this budget, although it's not as much as anybody would like, um, does the job and that we are spending enough. So for all of those reasons, um, I will vote in favor of the budget. Thank you, Councilor Backer. Does anyone else? Like to make a comment? Any discussion? No? I have one thing to add, um, echoing some of what Councillor Backer said. It, it'll be short. It's in response to a couple questions I've received in the community. I just want to clarify. Um, I was questioned by um, someone at the public hearing a couple weeks ago about what sort of public notification there had been, um, not of the budget process, but even before that last fall when um, the council was thinking about voting on the three different town council resolutions having to do with taxes. And when I spoke a couple weeks ago, what I said in answer to this citizen's very relevant question was that we had not had a public hearing, but there had been an opportunity for public input. And I, I sense from further conversations with this person that there is some confusion perhaps in some citizens' minds about what is the difference. And I'd just like to make that clear just so, so that everybody understands. When I used the word public hearing, I was talking about a formal public hearing. It's a legal term that describes what the council is legally required, a session we're supposed to have before we pass the budget or make an ordinance change. Um, whether there is a legally mandated public hearing on a council item or not, the council is always open, I should say, to hearing input from the public on any item on the agenda. In fact, as we know just from a few minutes ago, we even have a session, well, two in fact, every evening for people to speak on any topic that they'd like to speak on if it's not on the agenda that night. But then if it's a topic that is on the agenda, all we have to do is raise their hand and be recognized and then they can come up to the podium and speak. So I just wanted to say in short that the citizen welcomes and wants input from the public. Whether we're having a formal public hearing um, or not, we want to hear from citizens. We welcome your input. We want to know what you think. The citizen, uh, the council also receives input by email, which you can access through the website. You can as Councilor Backer said, get us all with one button. 
um, we we get letters, we get phone calls, and we run into people at IGA and at Jonesy's and places like that, and we're always willing. I, I know I speak for all the counselors when I say that we're always willing to hear um, what people say, and we welcome people's views. So there are many opportunities for citizen input for those who want to share their opinions with us. And then secondly, more specifically, this citizen had questions about uh, last fall what sort of public notification there was before the council resolutions that had to do with um, capping spending and with returning to the taxpayers any uh, excess, any additional money that the town received as a result of question one being passed. And I just want to reiterate that um, the council adopted its council goals in August of 04 as item number 40 on the agenda, which was distributed to the press. It was on the website five days before the meeting date, and under that goal was 1F, apply additional net state revenue resulting from question one vote towards property tax relief. There was a story on the website about this. That all happened in August. A month later, um, at the September meeting, that's when the council resolutions having to do with taxes were on the agenda. That agenda was emailed to over 60 people who were on the email list. That includes about 10 members of the press who represent various different um, newspapers around town that cover Cape Elizabeth. It was also on uh, emailed to school officials, to the superintendent. Um, it was on the website. Um, what else? It was emailed to about 18 private citizens who have asked to be put on that email list just because they like to know what's going on in town. Um, after the agenda was distributed, for the September meeting, I received some feedback from counselors that the wording was confusing and lumped too much together. So we broke the, the wording into three separate resolutions. That revised language was um, emailed to the press. Um, and I also made a special effort and sent a personal email to the um, chairman of the school board and to the superintendent just to let them know, give them a heads up that there was a language change and what was going on. So I just wanted to let people know that there, there had been notification before that meeting. I did not hear a public outcry before the meeting, and I think that's understandable um, because the Pulaski Initiative was on the horizon at that point, and I think everyone was uh, understandably very concerned about the $3 million that could be potentially cut from the school budget. Um, at that point. And lastly, I should add that um, the topic of these potential resolutions was brought up at the tax cap task force meeting, um, meetings which were held nine times over that summer. It wasn't brought up at every meeting, but it was brought up several times. And the, the wording of um, one of the resolutions, the second one, was detailed in the one page report to the community from the Cape Elizabeth tax cap task force which was distributed to every household for free in Cape Elizabeth in the September 4th Cape Courier. Um, so I, I just want to reassure people that this was not done in a vacuum and there, was, um, there were plenty of opportunities. I'm not sure how else other than through the press and the email and meetings and personal correspondence that um, the council could have gotten the word out. But I just want to reassure everyone that we do try to not only receive your input but we try to communicate with you, and I would welcome any other suggestions. If people have um, more effective ways they think that we could get the word out, I'd be happy to hear them, and you can send me an email by getting on the website. So I hope that wasn't too long-winded, but I did want to reassure the very valid concerns of a couple of citizens who were concerned that since they hadn't known about it beforehand, maybe that it hadn't been well publicized. So I think, I think it was. There. If there's no other discussion, let's move the question. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank Councillor Backer for his hard work, as well as the rest of the councillors, but especially Councillor Backer. He was our finance chair this year and did a, a really great job, kept us all on track, uh, on track and uh, I appreciate his efforts, as well as those of the town manager and everyone in the, the town staff, also the school board and the superintendent and everyone in the school system. It's always a difficult 
process because there's never enough money to give everyone all the money that they need for very important but competing needs. And I just want to thank everyone for their good humor and their professionalism and um, hanging in there. Thank you very much. Next item is item number 161, which has to do with the sewer fund budget. Do I hear a motion? Councilor Backus? Um, first, I'd like to make a motion that we consider um, items 161, 0405 through 167, 0405 um, in block as a group, but using the Latin as uh, I have learned from our town manager. Okay. Is there a second? I'd second that. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor of considering them together? It's unanimous. Okay, is there a motion on the group? Councilor Backer? I move that we adopt the uh, proposed budgets for fiscal year 2006 for the sewer fund, Riverside Cemetery Fund, Spurwing Church Fund, Fort Williams Capital, Fort Williams Park Capital Fund, Thomas Jordan Fund, Rescue Fund, and Port Portland Headlight Fund, all as further presented in this evening's agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. That brings us to item number 1680405, which is a report from the Ordinance Committee. And uh, Council Roberts is our chair of the Ordinance Committee. Would you like to present this? Thank you. Um, what this proposal is, uh, it was a request from Mary Page, the owner of the Two Lake General Stewart. I, I will mention David's position, but. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, Jack. Um, Councilor Lynch properly reminded me that this is probably the appropriate time for me to recuse myself in this matter um, as is being raised for this evening's discussion. Okay. So um, I recused my, I've recused myself at each step of the way throughout this. Um, and with the council's permission, I'm not sure whether a separate vote is required. But I think we need a motion to accept your recusing yourself. I make a motion that we accept Council Backer's recusal. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought I saw a hand over there. But, um, so it was uh, all in favor? One, two, three. Six. Against? Seven? I mean, no. one? <laughs> It would be Sorry, Councilor Moles. Five and one. Um, yes, but does he vote to recuse himself? He did not vote to recuse himself. Okay, then five and one. Thank but you. I did vote to recuse He did vote. He raised his hand. I, I was counting that hand. Do we need a motion for me to recuse myself from the vote? <laughs> no, I will. No, I think he needs to go sit down there. <laughs> okay. I just don't like to see people recuse themselves. If they're elected by the public to come up and okay. I don't think there's that much of a conflict in this issue. Okay. Well, I think if Councilor Backer feels he should recuse himself, we will accept his decision on that. I just so, value, so noted. I value his input. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Councilor Roberts, back to you. Well, at this time, it would be appropriate to thank uh, Councilor Swift Kayada, our chairman, for stepping in and filling the third slot in this position when uh, Councilor Backer was unable to do it. And what the request uh, before the ordinance committee was to uh, make a recommendation to either grant, uh, accept or deny the, uh, the language change of changing the uh, wetland setbacks in an RP1 critical zone from 250 feet to 100 feet. Uh, the uh, recommendation of the Climatic Committee was two in favor of, of such, one opposed, that being myself. Uh, and the proposal before us this evening would be to 
uh, place this item on uh, the June uh, uh, agenda for a public hearing. So that I would uh, move that we uh, schedule the public hearing for June, I believe, four. What's the date of the next council meeting? 13th. 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 June 13th. I'm way ahead of myself. Okay. The schedule of public hearing for June 13th on the VA wetlands amendment. And I don't know, do people want a map or a Maureen to speak to the area that it includes perhaps a little bit before we actually vote on it? Perhaps that would even be an order. And Bruce Smith is here too. So, so I'd move, make that motion, but then I'd ask Maureen perhaps to give us a, a brief and explanation. During, during discussion, is, is there a second to that? I second that motion. Okay. Uh, discussion? I would, I would ask if possible if the town planner could give just a brief explanation of how that zone works and where it's located for the public so that they'll have some idea next month what it is in fact we're talking about. Does the council want to see a map of this area as well or certainly let me put it up while you talk. a little different from the map that's in your packet because you haven't put gray in where the roads are. But basically this is Route 77 right in here. Um, this is, let's see, we've got Broad Cove Road running down this way and the Two Lights General Store is this building right here. So the red are approximate location of building footprints. The purple is the Business A District on Route 77. So it, it starts up here with the Two Lights General Store and it heads south and ends um, with the Agway store on one side of the street and the dairy bar on the other side of Route 77. So, um, and then this green area is the best mapping the town has available on a town-wide basis for where the wetlands of the town are located. And in our zoning ordinance and on the zoning map, it clearly states that wetland boundaries, resource protection boundaries, have to be field verified. The reason they have to be field verified is that the mapping that we have available is from the county soil survey. The county soil survey is based on aerial photography. Uh, and the aerial photography doesn't pick up aggregates of soils that are less than two and a half acres in size. So the reality is that um, it's not unusual for us to find that these wetland lines tend to move a little bit when we send people out there to map their wetlands based on the definition in our ordinance. And the situation that has arisen in this case, and it's, it's really not that uncommon, is that uh, when this area right up in here was mapped as part of uh, a due diligence pursuit of purchasing a portion of that land, it was discovered that in fact this is not all RP2 wetlands, that in fact starting at about here we have an RP1 wetland. RP1 wetland is depicted as dark green and it's very wet it's very heavily regulated. You're not allowed to do much in an RP1 wetland and you're not allowed to do much within 250 feet of an RP1 wetland. So if the RP1 wetland boundary is right here and then you measure out 250 feet, uh, what happens is a lot of this business aid district appears to be in what we call the RP1 buffer and there's very little that the property owners in that area can do. Um, they can continue to operate their businesses, they can continue to occupy their buildings, they can even expand their buildings up to 25% of the footprint as long as they don't go closer to the wetland. And there are some very specific provisions in the ordinance and I'll be happy to explain this if you want me to go into more detail. But um, the property owner in this case um, really did not want to be subject to those restrictions. Um, looked for other options and since the ordinance doesn't provide any other options, requested an amendment to the zoning ordinance. So what was considered and what is before you right now is to add one more provision to a provision in the ordinance that already exists. So if I can go back to that big RP1 wetland, 250 foot buffer. Right now there are four ways you can get the 250 foot buffer reduced. One is if you're in a densely developed area. Two is if the wetland itself is greater than one acre but less than two acres. The idea being that the 250 foot buffer would be greater than the actual size of the wetland. Uh, the third one is if the area that you're developing is topically distinct 
from the area of the wetland. You want to build here and the wetland is here and there's a big hill between you and you drain in this direction and they drain in that direction and never the two shall meet. Uh, a road is not con considered a topographical distinction. Uh, the fourth characteristic is if your wetland is actually a sand dune. We allow setbacks from sand dunes to be 100 feet. The state doesn't require any setbacks, so we're still pretty restrictive and protective of wet uh, sand dunes. The proposed amendment before you would add one more criteria to that list that would allow a buffer to be reduced from 250 feet to 100 feet. And that criteria would say, if a property is located in the Business A district and it's on public water and public sewer, they could reduce the buffer to 100 feet. Um, there are two Business A districts in town. The other one is on Shore Road, just before you get to the South Portland boundary line where the cookie jar is. There's no wetlands up there. So this is the only section of town that this uh, particular amendment mm -hmm. would apply to. And what it would do is it would take the buffer that looks like it's coming about here and pull it back to about here. Um, the other thing that we think it would do is that most of these properties in this part of town are not served by public sewer. Most of them are on septic systems. Most of those septic systems tend to be behind the buildings right next to the wetlands. So uh, the idea was it would be a way to allow there to be more dense development in the business zone, which, which is a much more efficient use of the very limited amount of area that's already zoned for business in town. And we tend to keep our business areas compact and not be migrating out of the business areas into residential zones. And it would also perhaps give an incentive to some of these property owners to connect up to the public sewer if they ever wanted to expand their business and found themselves in that buffer area. Any questions? Is there any questions for the planner? You can see why I asked Maureen to elaborate <laughs> on that. <laughs> that was a wise choice. I, I have one question. Yeah. Um, Maureen, if a business like the one we're speaking about that requested the amendment were to connect to the public sewer versus staying on a septic system, do you think that would be, even if they expanded toward the wetland, would that be more environmentally friendly or less? Um, we could do a lot of analyses, and I'm not a scientist, but um, there's no doubt in my mind that the, the, out, the effluent from these septic systems are moving towards the wetland because it's downhill and it's where it, everything's going. Further, in this particular case, this business serves food. So it's a high generator of wastewater. And I think that if it was connected to the public sewer, it would be a much better environmental situation. Any more questions for the planner? Uh, Councilor Frisch. But is the request for this um, reduction of the, of the buffer area is the intent to stay the same in that business or is the intent to expand the business i believe the the business owner would like the option to expand in the future but there's been no formal application for expansion right now but that would be the reason for a request that's what we've been told yes Ma maureen as i recall um has that business owner already fallen under one of those other uh, yes, right, are, uh, the rules? One of the so could expand anyways, even without these rules? They can expand right now. They're, as they're, even if you're in this 250 foot buffer, if you're already in the buffer, there are some specific provisions that allow you to expand your building in certain ways. But there are restrictions. If you're within 100 feet of the wetland edge, you can expand towards the wetland. Um, wherever you are, you can increase your building foot, well, I think up to a certain point, you can expand your building foot from more than 25%. And I believe this property owner would like to have the full range of expansion options unfettered by wetland regulations. I think I was, I think I was talking, and forgive me, I mm -hmm. um, don't recall specifically, it, there was something about um, in B2, about of an area being considered densely developed if you count at least six buildings within 250 feet of it? Right. The whole, this whole thing was generated because the, the um, landowner would like to sell off a piece of property in here. Um, and this is when the due diligence on looking at the property discovered that, in fact, we had an RP1 wetland in here instead of an RP2. Uh, but 
the, there has since been an analysis done where if you pick the location where you want to develop the property, you measure out 250 feet and you draw a circle and you hit six main buildings, you are considered in a densely developed area. And if you're in a densely developed area, your buffer automatically can be reduced down to 100 feet. So this project right here is actually moving forward and has just been submitted to the planning board. Okay. okay. Council Moore. Madam Chairman, the uh, business owner happens to be present tonight if you'd like to ask her any questions or you could reserve that for the public hearing. Council, I'm sorry, does the council have any questions? Is that Ms. Page? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry, you're like behind the projector there. I didn't see you. Um, is, there, is there anything you'd like to say or is um, there anything that counselors would like to ask to clarify? No. No questions at this point, I guess. Thank you very much. I think we will, I assume we'll be voting for the public hearing, but there will be an opportunity to speak then too, um, unless you have something you want to say right now. Thank you, Maureen. Hi. I'm Could Mary you state Page. your name, please? I'm Mary Page. Thank you. Owner at 517 Ocean House Road. Thank you. Thank you. Life General Store. Um, we submitted this, again, under new findings. We purchased the property three years ago. Had no inkling that anything like this existed there. Um, when I submitted this, I want to make sure that it's understood that it's going to be in a business, it's in the business district. I'm not doing it for residential. I'm not only doing it for a business zone. Um, I would just like to kind of to clean up the property. The property is a mess. They've used it as a, as a literally a dump site for the last 30 years. A lot of a lot of things overgrown. A lot of trees. A lot of things need to be removed. Um, if this is indeed in a wetland. I, in turn, can't do any of this. So this is what I'm trying to do, is to clean up and make it look presentable at this time. And then if we, when we go to the public hearing, um, I'll be able to present some other things to you at that time. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. I believe we have, also have a Butters and the Conservation Commission represented here. They should also be afforded the same opportunity to speak if they wish to. And you raise your hand. I don't, I don't know who's who out in the audience, so I never know who's here for what. Yes, sir. I'm John Herrick. I'm chairman of the Conservation Commission, and I'm not really prepared, unfortunately, because I was unaware that I'd be addressing this uh, topic, but we did look at this last year, and um, our vote uh, at the commission was to recommend against any changes. Uh, in this particular uh, area. Uh, we felt that it would be setting a bad precedent and we felt that the uh, businesses could proceed um, as they are now without any hindrance and we didn't feel that there was any undue hardship here. It may be that we could change our mind. Uh, the, the owner may at the public hearing, uh, we may uh, want to study this further between now and the public hearing. We may want to um, talk about it at that time, but that was our vote um, last year was again, was a recommendation to the planning board that this not be changed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Back to you, Councilor. We've had a motion and a, uh, and a second, so I just, okay. unless other councilors like to speak, I would move the question. Okay. All in favor of setting this for public hearing? Five, and Councilor Backer is abstaining against one. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much to everybody who, who came tonight and spoke. And again, there will be an opportunity for much more complete um, input <laughs> at next month's meeting at the public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Little housekeeping. <laughs> have we get, did we have the wrong name tags there or something? Mm -hmm. See what they have in front of you. Yeah, <laughs> now this is making me nervous about what's in front of my name, <laughs> in front of me. Okay. 
Um, next, we have item number 169-0405, which is also a report from the Ordinance Committee. So it's back to Councilor Roberts. This was the, the ordinance from uh, Hades, I guess is the term to call it. Uh, staff has put years of effort in there getting this before us. Uh, it was a, a mandated uh, ordinance that uh, I think it was the NPEDES, uh, something like that. I'm not even sure what it stands for, but it was the state mandated requirement that we have an ordinance relating to stormwater uh, runoff and containment and drainage and everything else. And Maureen uh, O'Meara, our planning director, Bob Malley, public works director, spent an inordinate amount of time putting this together for us. They did have a, a model that they could work from that was helpful. And then Councillor Backer uh, volunteered, I would guess, probably 50 hours of legal services in, in, in wordsmithing this thing to the point where I don't believe anybody could now challenge it. <laughs> and so we are asking that this uh, language be uh, put before the, uh, the public for a public hearing on, on June 13th. Um, I'm not sure, is this language on the web, Mr. Town Manager? Pending ordinances can always be found on the website. All right, so it will be on the web if anybody is really interested in taking the time to read it. But it is primarily a housekeeping ordinance that we have to have on the books. I don't, uh, the public works director, and I don't like to speak for him, but I don't believe Bob felt that it will ever get an awful lot of play um, as far as doing anything differently than we always did. It's just now put in, in code. So with that, I would move that we place uh, item number 169-0405, a stormwater ordinance. Uh, on the agenda for public hearing on June 13 of 05. Can we hear a second? Second? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I just have a question. Council um, um, On the, we're including in the stormwater intensity um, a two to 25 year storm. Why, why are we putting in, I'm, I'm assuming Maureen will be able to address that. Why are we putting in two to 25 year? And, and I'm also wondering whether, and I think it was 25 year when I was on the planning board, and um, I think we've had some 50 year, some 100 year storms since then. And I wonder if that's added. Sure. Um, what we did, as, as Councilor Roberts stated, the, the real instigation for having to open up this unpleasant section of the ordinance <laughs> was the federal requirement that we had to uh, regulate a certain new section of stormwater and we decided that instead of adopting a whole new ordinance we would insert it into an existing ordinance and since we were inserting it into an ordinance that was I think last reviewed in 1972 we figured that we would go in and take this opportunity to also update what we already had and so the section you're referring to which I think is the first part um, right around page three um, that section, we had our town engineer review that, and he basically went through and made some recommended changes to bring the ordinance into compliance with the kind of reviews we do today. So it is standard practice uh, for us today to request calculations and design for both the two and the 25 year storm, and that's why we included both of those. Uh, we don't require designs for larger storms, um, quite frankly it would mean that we would have very, very large culverts under our roads for storms that happen very rarely. So we really do focus on the two and 25 year storm. Thank you. Further questions? Discussion? No? Okay. All in favor of setting this for public hearing? That wasn't a question, right? That was a quick vote? Okay. All in favor of setting for public hearing? Seven, it's unanimous. Thank you. Wasn't sure if that was a last minute question or just a, a quick vote, so. Thank you. And I wanna thank um, our town planner and also our code enforcement officer and Bob Malley, our public works director for their work on both, both either or both of these last two items. Thank you. Um, 
Item number 170 this has to do with a bond resolution for the sewer rehabilitation project. Do I hear a motion? I would move that we authorize an expenditure of up to $5.4 million for improvements to the town's sewer system and the issuance of up to $5.4 million in bonds to finance such expenditure as more fully set out in the item um, 170 of our agenda. Second. And moved and seconded. Is there discussion <coughs> questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Seven, unanimous, thank you. Item number 171 Yes, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to report that Maureen once again has been working with uh, Bud Newell at the Bureau of Parks and Land, uh, trying to help uh, implement one of the town council's goals this year, uh, which is to uh, implement the Gulf Crest Master Plan. <coughs> and the council earlier had authorized the grant application, I believe it was originally $25,000. $30,000, the state and its wisdom ranked our grant uh, almost the very top of all the grants. However, they wanted to spread the wealth across everywhere. Maybe they saw Kate Elizabeth was up in some of the list. Who knows? So, uh, <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> so anyway, they, uh, they were good enough to uh, uh, indicate that they're willing to give us a grant of $15,000 and uh, uh, Maureen can answer any detailed questions, but it would really be helpful coming up with the trail day and uh, with the other work uh, that's ongoing to continue to implement uh, the Gulf Crest Master Plan. Uh, so I want to thank Maureen, thank the Maine Bureau of Parks and Land, the National Park Service where the funds ultimately come from, and uh, thank the Conservation Commission as well for, I, for they know it will be their efforts as well in helping to implement this. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Do I hear a motion? Jack? I would move that uh, the grant be accepted and the town manager be authorized to sign the documents required from the uh, grant source. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, and would would we have added to that, Could would you accept 15, a friendly? 15,000. Yes, that, that too, but to authorize the expenditure of the funds once the contract is returned. That's Certainly. That's, that, didn't I say that? I don't know. Maybe you did. <laughs> I, I could be like losing my mind or just going to death. Um, so it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councilor Roberts? Now I know where that June 4 date popped into my mind. That's going to be the, uh, the trails day that the Conservation Commission is <laughs> heading up. It's a Saturday and they're going to be doing the trails at Goldcrest. So I'll put a little plug in for it right now while we've got it on the, uh, on the agenda. Isn't it comforting to know there was really a reason why There's some reason why that date was sticking in my head, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All in favor? Seven. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. And I want to echo, echo the manager's thanks to everyone, Maureen and everyone else who's uh, been involved in getting this and to the to the Conservation Commission for their future endeavors on this project. I know they'll be working hard on it. Okay, item number 172.04.05 has to do with the proposed change in the Greenbelt Trail. Would you like to introduce this? Yeah, I'll do a brief introduction. I think Maureen looks like she has another plan there. But back in, in 2003, uh, K and R, is that the name of it? Reality. Uh, submitted an application to the planning board looking for a subdivision in the Golden Ridge area. As part of that, uh, they wanted to uh, move to uh, work with us on Greenbelt issues, and they also wanted to relocate a portion of the Greenbelt. At that time, the Conservation Commission was heavily involved, as they always are, uh, with issues coming before the planning board. Uh, uh, involving the green belt and subsequently the planning board did approve uh, a proposal to add an addition to the green belt uh, whereas whereby off 
Golden Ridge Lane, which is a, a driveway that's uh, off 77, the dirt road, uh, private access way, I guess we call it, is the, in the town vernacular, uh, to, in essence, the Greenbelt Trail is now situated between the Hagman property and the Powell property. Instead, they want to go down the driveway and then hang a left and then a right back on the, the spray easement uh, for the green belt and to abandon the, uh, the existing green belt at the point where it intersects, uh, you know, back to uh, Route 77 between the Hagman and the Powell. Uh, in accordance with council procedure, uh, before any of the construction actually occurs, uh, it's uh, up to the council to decide if there's eventually things that the municipality is going to need to accept for you to give or not give conditional municipal approval. Uh, recently, uh, the Kennedys, who are the, the principals of K&R Realty, uh, came to my office and indicated that they were now prepared to begin. Uh, we indicated to them they needed to give us a performance guarantee. They, they gave us one to, to not for the whole project, but to set off so there's enough money if it gets started, finished, we can commit to finish it. Uh, and uh, that's where it now stands. It's given us some deeds. Uh, we are a little uncomfortable with some of the language in the deeds, but it's something we'd have reviewed by a town attorney uh, anyway before we, we actually accepted any of this. So uh, the recommendation from the planning board, as I understand it, is to uh, conditionally accept the proposed new uh, Greenbelt Trail uh, off Golden Ridge Lane as shown on the plan uh, dated December 16th. 2003. Did I get that right, Marnie? Could I ask a question for clarification? Was it also the planning board's recommendation that this new potential easement replace the current easement? Did they say it says it, it said yeah. they would approve this new new one, but it it did say that, that it would replace the current one. I know there was lots of discussion at the time, but I'm looking for Maureen to. Uh, Perhaps Maureen's get getting a workout. She's going to wear a rut in that rug going back and forth on these items. Maybe you could help us out, Maureen. Uh, I believe in your packet there's a letter dated December 19, 2003, and it records a decision on the planning board of December 16, 2003. Um, there's a lot of findings. There's a motion, and condition number four in the approval states that the planning board recommends to the town council that the existing pedestrian easement, which is the one that's down over here, um, not be extinguished until a Greenbelt Trail is installed in the new easement, which has been inspected for compliance with the approved plans by the Conservation Commission. Um, they did accept the proposal that one trail would be replaced by a new trail. They relied on that, uh, that acceptance by the recommendation, the strong endorsement of the Conservation Commission, but everybody involved understood that, that no one has authority to abandon a town easement or to accept a town easement except the town council. If I might, in my draft amendment varies from the planning board recommendation in only one respect. When it, when it comes to inspecting improvements, whether or not they're completed or not completed, the standard procedure is we send out the town engineer and the town engineer certifies that it's been completed in accordance with the plan. We generally don't have a, a citizen board do that. We have the town engineer actually go out and inspect it, look at the plans and provide the certification. That's the only variance in my recommendation to what the planning board recommends. Okay. Thank you. Is there, is there a motion on this? We don't have a motion yet. I would make a motion for the purposes of being able to discuss it. I have some questions of uh, Maureen and others on um, so I, I want to be clear my motion is just for the purpose of discussing, discussing it. And I, I would move that we accept the transfer of um, the land from, I just want to make sure I'm clear, accept the transfer of the land on Golden Ridge Lane for the purpose of possibly relocating the Greenbelt Trail. And just to be clear, I am not moving at this point that we would abandon any section of the trail. So, so that would be my motion. Is there a second? Second. 
It's been moved and seconded. Now we can discuss it. Okay. I oh. would like okay. to mention that if there's detailed questions, the Kennedys are here, the principals of Kay and I really, as well as Jim Fisher, who was their consultant with Northwest <coughs> Consultant, who worked with them during the planning board process. Okay. Maureen? Yes. Okay. Okay. Discussion. I, oh, actually, I have a question. I, I'm not sure whether it should go to Maureen or the planning board, so I'll look to the town manager uh, maybe to help decide who to direct it to. But I drove uh, down Golden Ridge Lane today, and my understanding is as you drive in on the lane, the easement is on your left, the proposed easement. That was a very, very wet today, underwater in fact, in places. And so I guess my question is, first of all, can we construct a pedestrian easement through what looks to me, and I, obviously I'm not a, an expert, but it looks like it may be an RP1 to me. Um, so that's my question. Can we actually construct an easement under our ordinances um, or are we going to run into what we ran into out at Gullcraft, where we wanted to do some boardwalks and the DEP had some real issues with how wide they could be because of shade? Maureen, I think that question's gonna go to you. And yeah, well, the good news is it's not a saltwater wetland. So yes, we don't run into problems with DEP and shading. Um, the mapping done by the applicant did not show that area to be a wetland. If, however, it was a wetland under our regulations, you can still build a trail in it. It's one of the few things that are permitted in, in RP1 and RP2 wetlands uh, by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Okay. But, how but how judicious would that be? Is this particular path wetter or drier than the existing path? I would suggest that this particular path is wetter than the existing path. The, the goal, the, the proposed path is wetter than the current. And, and I, I do want to make sure that you do know the Conservation Commission members are here because they did spend a lot of time talking about it. And there was some real in-depth discussions about why would you abandon one trail for another trail? And they've got some very detailed reasons why they thought this was a better spot. And, it, it would be probably better for them to articulate it than, than I, since they're here. Uh, but the, the design that was shown in the planning board approved plans was intended to compensate for those issues by building up the trail, by creating a boardwalk over a culverted area so that we would still have a level, dry walking surface not as dry and level as the one we have right now, but of, a, of an adequate quality that the Conservation Commission thought that this was a good swap. Okay. Carol? I went down the road as well today, and um, I mean, it, it appears that the area that's being proposed for the new easement is essentially the drainage ditch for the side of the road. Again, this was a long discussion by the Conservation Commission and by the Planning Board, and the applicant was required to acquire a grading easement and to not put the trail in the ditch. Um, that was one of the issues about making sure that the trail was level. I guess now would be a good time to point out that what's out there right now is not what was designed and approved by the Planning Board. But I haven't, I mean, you've mentioned um, boardwalk yeah. tonight, but mm -hmm. I didn't see anything about boardwalk in this plan or that there was any intention of the current owner to um, maintain this. Once a trail is constructed and the easement rights are conveyed to the town, it, it's the town who takes responsibility for maintenance. Uh, the plans do, however, you, you can't see them because of the scale you're at. But there is a section right here where there's some drainage coming through, and the plans do call for a boardwalk crossing, a culvert and boardwalk crossing there, so that you, know, you wouldn't be running the trail through a wet area. 
that that structure is not yet in. No, I mean, yeah. Okay, Council Mills. Do uh, they have some other maps they wanted to put up and show us tonight? I see a roll of paper down. Sure. I just wanted to make sure we're done with Maureen, at least for the moment. All right. Councilor Lynch, do you have another question? I have Maureen. I guess oh. two more questions for Maureen or perhaps the Conservation Commission. One is um, I want to be clear who, who, who will pay for the improvements to the um, easement on Golden Ridge Lane? Would all of those be done, including the boardwalk by the developer? or would the town need to pay for the improvements? The intention is for all of that work to be done by the developer. And it's one of the reasons that both the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board were very clear that they're, that they're, they're not dictating to the council, that they are as strongly as they possibly can recommending to you that there be no swap of one trail for the other until the new trail has actually been built the way they said it was going to be built. And then my second question is, I, I guess I'd like some elaboration on why uh, the Golden Ridge Lane Trail is preferable to the Conservation Commission to the existing trail. Could we get someone from the Conservation Commission to come up? And then, and we, I, I promise we won't forget you. <coughs> we're sort of going where the, conversa where the uh, questions lead us at this point. Uh -huh. John Herrick, Chairman of the Conservation Commission. Mike Duddy is also here, who is the immediate past chairman. He was chairman at the time this uh, was handled. Um, I believe was the, um, uh, the existing trail uh, it, it is on a driveway. It starts on a driveway at Route 77 at Hagman. I believe it's the Hagman property. And I, everybody is very uncomfortable, I think, about going down somebody's driveway to go on a, on a public trail. Now, it's my understanding that easement was there before the driver was put in, but that is not part of this discussion. But um, I don't know why it was allowed to happen that way, but it happened. The Conservation Commission felt that in order to get, uh, have people feel at ease about using that trail, which is a very important part of our overall Greenbelt network because it accesses a great pond from Route 77 that people would feel, uh, would feel uneasy about going down somebody's driveway and then going halfway down and then branching off to the right to pick up the trail up to the pond. When this came up uh, about a year and a half or more ago, we thought it might be an interesting swap, give us a, a, a better entrance to, uh, to Great Pond uh, directly from 77 if there was a trail on it, all on its own, uh, without going down somebody's driveway, without looking like we're going trans trespassing on somebody's property, which, to, which of course we were not doing, but it looked like that sometimes, I think, to the, to the neighbors near there. So we felt that if, there were, if a good trail could be developed going down uh, beside um, Golden Ridge Lane and then cutting over through the woods, we could pick up the, um, the Great Pond Trail and it would be a better access. Um, I went this is not answering your question. I mean, that's a little bit of the history of, from my perspective. And we have not discussed this recently as a commission because I'm meeting it tomorrow night. Would it be appropriate for me to um, read excerpts from a letter that we sent to the planning board in November 2003? That's a little bit in addition to the question. Certainly, if the counselor wants, to, counselors want to hear. Sure. Is that all right. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, the uh, Conservation Commission wrote, and I'm not going to read this, I'm just going to read basically three sentences out of it. Uh, in November 13, 2003, we wrote a, a uh, memorandum to the um, planning board about the Golden Ridge subdivision. And we give reasons about, you know, what we went through here. Down at the bottom, there were half a dozen recommendations. Now, Mar I ta talked to Maureen today a couple of times. I've also walked down the trail today too. And there were three sections, uh, three points in here that really stand up that hit me right in the face. I'm going to read item two. Sections of a split rail fence were to be installed to emphasize that the trail and the road were separate. 
anybody who's been down there, of course, there's no, there's no split rail fence. Item number three, a buffer of shrubs and trees were to be planted between the road and the trails to complement the split rail fence and to help differentiate the trails from the lane. Uh, I don't believe anything is planted down there. It looks like uh, residual scrub growth. Some of it's been knocked over and it's a little hard to get through. It's not very attractive. Item number four, culverts extending under the road were also to be extended past the trails to avoid drainage swales cutting across the trail. This is what we've heard tonight. It's full of water. You cannot walk down that trail. Unless you want to get your feet on it, of course, wear rubber boots. Um, the, uh, there, were no, the culverts, there were two culverts going under Golden Ridge Lane that conduct drainage water into the trail. On the, there's a large area where one culvert uh, drains water, and there's a large wet area, uh, several inches deep. It's, 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 and it, it's going to be that way whenever it rains. I don't think it's going to be just this spring. Um, there was a second culvert, and there was that packing pallet uh, over that, so about four by four, taking place of a bridge, so you can get across that. Probably not the prettiest uh, bridge or boardwalk uh, that we have on the trails. It, it, it's useful, um, but certainly it's not what was intended. When we looked at this earlier, we intended to have uh, a dry area to have the drainage continue out so there would not be this collection of drainage water right in the trail. Uh, it's, and it, it's just an unsuitable trail. The trail is absolutely not finished. There, there was a, a trail cut down there beside Golden Ridge Lane. Uh, it's been hacked out. Uh, there are some tree stumps in there that are very uh, inappropriate. Uh, there's certainly been an effort made. I'm going to take, I, will, I will admit that there has been an effort made to build a trail. It is not complete though. Even if you took that as, a, as an acceptable trail, there was no connection to uh, to the uh, Great Pond Trail. There was a field as you turn left, or as you go across the second driveway, you can turn left and go across somebody's private property, but that's not the easement. The easement's further down through the woods. That's marked out, but there's no trail there. There's been no work done there, there at all. So I think I can speak for the Conservation Commission, I hope I can anyway, uh, that we uh, feel very strongly that this should not be accepted in its present condition, that the conditions uh, that were specified uh, to the planning board should be met before the town council accepts this easement. So I urge you uh, not to accept it at this time. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify that what Mr. Herrick described is exactly the action that's proposed before the council. Uh, the reason none of those things are done is because the applicant started doing it and the town gave them a stop, stop work order, forced them to stop. Uh, because at that time it wasn't covered by a performance guarantee and the council had not yet given uh, conditional municipal acceptance. They simply are not allowed to do that work under the town rules until uh, the council takes some action this evening uh, or, or, or at some later date. Uh, the, you know, what the town engineer would be certifying under the proposed motion is in fact that all of those things are done, that everything is done in accordance with the approved plan uh, you know, the, the applicants sort of caught in a the catch-22 right now. You know, we're telling them that they can't start as the staff, so that's the way the rules read. And, you know, I, and I hear the Conservation Commission this evening, representatives saying it ought not to be accepted because none of it's done. You know, that's, that's not really fair to the applicants because, uh, you know, in this instance, uh, the rules provide they can't do the work uh, until the performance guarantee is in place and until there's been an indication of uh, municipal municipal conditional acceptance of uh, of the easement. So, you know, while, while I understand that work's not done, that's really to, to no fault of the applicant. And, and to the contrary, it's not done because the town said they couldn't do it. Thank you. I'd like to give the Kennedys a chance to come speak. <clears throat> Could you state your name, sir, please? Jeff Kennedy. Thank you. Uh, I'd love to get all that work done tomorrow, but I got, like Mr. McGowan said, I got shut down in the middle of it, so there's really nothing I could do. That trail is wet right now, but I think 90% of the trails in Maine are wet right now, all the way rain we've had. We're only moving the trail 280 feet, so 
go toward Golden Ridge. That's all we're moving it. We are going to have six inches of gravel with six inches of back mulch on top of it. So it is going to sit above the swale and, the, and we will put these two spots. We are going to put the coverage and then extend it. Um, any questions? Councilor Roberts. Thank you for coming and speaking to us. I have one question, I guess. The trail now currently goes right straight towards 77 on high and dry ground. Uh, very little maintenance. The town can just take a, a large mower, go down once or two or three times a summer and clear it out. There's no boardwalks to replace. There's no culverts to worry about. There's, we don't have the wet issue. It's close to the Crescent Beach. Why as a development, you're, you're putting a development in back over here. Why are you proposing even putting a, a green belt over there rather than leaving it over where it was in the first place? What's in, why, why would you want to do that? Because truthfully, they don't use it now. They use my road and they come right down the middle of Golden Ridge and cut across. Check with Stevie Young and Leslie. People parked up there where it says no parking. Get out of their car, walk their dogs through the yard and onto the trail. Nobody uses the existing trail now the way it's set up through the neighborhood. They're not comfortable. We want to make it user friendly. We want to put signs. This trail is going to go right to the ice cream store's parking lot, which is town parking for that green boat. They can park the car, walk right down the trail, and right into the woods. They're doing it now anyway. So there's no difference. Uh, I, okay, I'll address my accounts first by some of the council. But thank you. I don't know. Any more? Oh, sorry, Council McKenzie. Um, you mentioned signs. I know a few years ago when my kids and I tried to find that trail, it was very difficult to find. We yep. figured it out, but there, there, was, there are no signs present. Right. Is part of this proposal to put proper signage up so people can yes. locate it? Right out on 77, but like I said, it's going to be adjacent to where you can park, so it will be very visible okay. and up through there. More questions for Mr. Kennedy? I'm not sure this is to Mr. Kennedy, but I mean, it's a town Greenbelt trail, so I'm not sure private citizens put up the signs for a Greenbelt trail. We, as a town, do it. Well, I, I guess um, the manager can answer them. It, the Greenbelt signs are, are put up cooperatively uh, between Maureen and, uh, and the Public Works sometimes gets involved. But we, we try to get the, 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 the uh, things to the property owner and say, put them up. Sometimes we put them up as well, but the, what do you call those things? The G signs, but there's another name for them. Green belt signs. Green belt signs. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was, yeah. So we, it's a cooperative arrangement between the, the town and the, the uh, property. The, the reason I ask is because uh, when you go by Golden Ridge Road now, mm -hmm. there's private access neighbor, um, residents and right. guests only. That's not you know, obviously that sign can come down. Right, anybody. right. Okay. I was so they used, right. Well, that was the previous owner trying to keep the people from walking up there and using the green belt. I, yeah, I mean, they don't see the sign, but it's bad. More questions for the discussion, Councilor Mole. I want to see more pictures. They're a they're aching to pull them out. So let's let's see the pictures. <laughs> okay, if you've got pictures or map or something to show us, come right ahead, please. Could you state your name, sir, please, so everybody Thank knows you, who you are? Members of the council, my name is Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions. Uh, I'm here at the uh, behest of the Kennedys this evening just to answer any technical questions you may have, uh, some of which have been posed here just a little bit earlier, and I would like to address those and, uh, and then basically uh, guide you through this process uh, relative to what we would like to do, uh, notwithstanding any other comments that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy would like to make. In, um, uh, in essence, what I'd like to do is just orient us to the map. This is obviously where the Greenbelt Trail is right now. It connects to the trail. It comes on down to uh, Great Pond. This shaded area right here, that which is on your map, is the area to which we would like to move it. What I'd like to point out is I think there was an issue raised earlier, I'm not sure by whom, regarding the, uh, the drainage portion of it and the actual topographical elevation portion here. What you'll see based on the, if you're interested, based on the topography plan, or the topographic plan that we submitted and that was uh, eventually <coughs> the planning board, 
this section of the trail right in here <coughs> is actually predominantly higher than this area that's right over here. There are a couple of minor exceptions. However, from a drainage perspective, the section that you may see here, those of you who are able to drive down, emphasizing, of course, that again, as Mr. McGovern pointed out, this trail is nowhere near completed. It's only really been grubbed out. There's a lot more work to do. Uh, but in conjunction with the, the topography actually being slightly higher in this section, uh, the proposed trail is actually going to be more level than what you've got out here. Now, this is fairly level when you literally walk across it, ski across it, whatever you may do. Um, however, right in this section up here, it's fairly worn down as trails get. Um, in rains like today, you're going to find out that this is quite muddy. People tend to walk around it. That's okay. It's not a big issue. What we've got over here, as Mr. Kennedy had indicated, in, and this is at the behest of the town and the, the town's engineer, is that the, the subgrade base of this is going to be about this deep full of uh, drainage gravel. Then it's going to be covered on the top with the, like the natural wood chipping that you would tend to see in a deeper woods environment. Point is, as far as maintenance is concerned, once this is created, uh, matter of opinion, subjective to be sure, but I would contend that this is from a maintenance perspective actually going to be easier to maintain as far as its quality of wicking away stormwater to the point where anybody in days like we had this past weekend, if they want to go out in the rain, they're actually going to find a drier path in this section than they would over here. Relatively minor, but overall the creation of the path was meant to be better than the one that's there now. Otherwise, we wouldn't really have much of a standard to be able to say, hey, we want to do something worse, can we do it anyway? That generally doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There are two drainage paths that are right over here that uh, come down from the wetland that's over in this section. Uh, it ceases to be a wetland in this particular area because of a culvert that was put in right up in here scores of years ago. Then uh, there's another uh, sway or another uh, a drainage area right through here because on either side of Golden Ridge Lane, which itself is relatively flat, in order to prevent flooding of the road or the driveway, the private access way, there are drainage swales that were created when the road was created in scores of years ago. In order to mitigate the influence of that stormwater as it flows off the road into both of those drainage swales, we, uh, in conjunction with construction of the road and the trail, we constructed a, or we designed a series of culverts that will be much more effective now than they, well, much more effective when they're put in here fairly soon uh, relative to those that are there now, one of which is virtually clogged completely. Uh, which is why you have some of the flooding problem that you do when you take a look at that after the spring thaw and the substantial rains that we've had, because the culverts there right now are undersized and they're, they're full. Uh, they don't work. So we're looking to do an improvement of this, and you will walk over the tops of these culverts, uh, where, or you mean whoever's going to be using this path, so that any drainage uh, from stormwater that does fall in the 2 to 25 to 50 to 100 year storm event uh, will have a better chance of actually being mitigated uh, where its flow takes it, as opposed to building up on either, either the trail or next to the road. So the bottom line in that case is that the, the trail as you see it here, or as it will be, uh, with the fence sections that were uh, approved by the, uh, the Conservation Commission, which will have to be there, that was part of the approval by the Planning Board, uh, the plantings, the various plantings of trees on both sides uh, of this uh, are actually going to create more of a wooded atmosphere, more of a, I would think, natural atmosphere to be able to go down than, as uh, some other member here brought up, walking literally down this gentleman's driveway uh, in order to be able to access a, a path through what's going to be somebody's yard, uh, which is right over here. So this is the private property that you can see right here. This is the house lot. Now, I know that we don't pay you know, specific attention to development or home lots relative to uh, Greenbelt Trail, except in this case, you're not going to see further development. It can't go there um, where the trail is right now. Through here, you could end up having a trail that's going to be quite literally a few feet from somebody's front yard, or, or in somebody's front yard, a few feet from the domicile. In this particular case, because it's right along the property line, all of which is wooded, with a direct connection to the trail over here, we're keeping it as conservationally uh, uh, intact as possible. Now, we did work uh, through multiple meetings with the Conservation Commission. Uh, we had some proposals back and forth and basically came up with this one as the most acceptable to the Commission relative to the Planning Board's approvals, all of which will be constructed by the Kennedys in conjunction with the final approval. As Mr. McGovern stated, we're not actually asking for that final approval as far as get ridding, getting rid of this easement relative to this one. We wouldn't ask for that or, or whatever the staff process is until obviously this has been approved. And I think Marie mentioned or, or perhaps Mike mentioned that the town engineer will be the, the an independent disinterested party will be the reviewer to go out there and say, yes, everything has now been created. 
were constructed relative to the design that was approved by the other board commissions. So uh, toward that end, again, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I know Mr. Kennedy would as well. Yes, Councilor Roberts. A couple of questions. Um, I guess the first one, do we have to abandon the other trail? Or can we simply accept this one and take any markings off from the other one? We don't have to abandon the yes. other Yes. Why? Because that would not make that a, a better lot. The whole purpose behind this is to make this lot free and clear of any pass through. Is, is that the lot that's called lot A on, on the map? Yes. Okay. Second question, I guess. Who is going to be responsible for going in and it's a heavily vegetated area there? It's going to grow in very quickly. Um, who's going to be responsible for clearing that out, whereas we don't have to do it currently? That's going to have to be done on a regular basis. And who is, is there any money available to replace the, any wooden bridges and stuff that go in? We have them down in Great Pond, and we have an ongoing maintenance problem. It's a nightmare. With, whenever you have any maintenance wood, it doesn't last very long in wet areas. Right. Uh, not right now. There's nothing set aside for that. So that the town would buy that, basically. Well, I can address that issue as well. Um, there aren't any actually wooden bridges. These are these are the pathway that's created over the culvert. So everything is natural toward that end. Now, quite literally, if we get a 100-year storm, we're going to have a lot more to worry about than replacing a bridge. But I mean, yes, that could cause some erosion to be sure. Otherwise, what you're looking at is, ideally, and I'm not going to be naive enough to say that nobody is going to know that the culverts are there. But ideally, the culverts will be covered as culverts should. So that ostensibly, unless you're actually looking for them, particularly with the growth on either side of them, you're not going to really see them. They're not going to stand out. So this is not something that pressure treated or otherwise you're going to end up crashing through uh, as you walk through it 10 years from now when it does rot out. It doesn't rot out that way. It's just natural material. Councilor um, Fritz. Where in, on, on item six on the planning board, um, conditional or the, the conditions under which this would be approved talks about the applicant offering 40,000 square feet of open space along the southern edge of lot C with the connecting easement and I don't see lot C on my plan and I don't know where where is that From area the right is side of the road right here this is lot C To the right as you drive down the road for those of you who are familiar with the road the property that's owned by the kennedys is on both at the end of the road is on both sides the property that's immediately in front of you uh, has been sold by the kennedys to the young which is this property right here kennedys own this lot over here and this lot right here actually could you point again to lot c please? lot c is this section right here comes up around here and down about, about like this okay you also you. said something, if I might end. At the very last, Lot A, I heard you say the Kennedys, and I thought I heard you say Powell. I didn't hear what you said. Um, you found your option to someone? Yes. It could be a butter. It could be a butter. Yes. Lot A is. <laughs> I'm, but I'm still at, in my question, um, wondering how <coughs> that open space will benefit the public, I guess. And is that... I have a follow-up question to that one, too. Yeah, the, man the manager yeah. wants that to issue, the point. The open space does not directly relate to the green belt issue. Maureen and I have had a number of discussions about the open space over the last couple of years. That has not formally come to the council yet. It already has, and it was rejected. We rejected it, really? Yeah, yeah I so knew we were against right. it. Okay. This was the one the council turned down. So even though it was shown on the plan, yeah. the council did not conditionally agree to accept it. The council said keep it. Wet, we, had no we, didn't want to, we didn't want to take it off the tax roll. We figured you could keep it. Right. <laughs> so it doesn't. So it no longer relates to the subdivision approval because the, the town declined to accept it. What are the were you going to um, provide any open space, or were you going to do anything to compensate in our ordinance? Wasn't wasn't the provision just that that the applicant had to offer it? Not that they had to provide it, but they had to offer it. That's the standard. Provided if we took it. Right. That's the standard provision. We didn't of the subdivision take it. Ordinance. 
It was this lot that was shown by the planning board, this parcel as the offer. When uh, staff looked at it, ultimately when the council looked at it, it's the everyone said thank you, but no thank you. Council McKinney. I, I have to say that um, when, when we did hike down this trail, it was very uncomfortable. I, I recognized the sign that was off the road, and we realized that was the trail because we kind of knew we were in the general vicinity when we did this with my, my children. It, excuse me, do you mean the current trail the current or the trail, proposed the current okay. trail? And I think it's, it's an awkward place. It's awkward because you're going through somebody's yard. Even if it is an easement, you really are right there. I think somebody was playing frisbee at the time. It felt really strange to walk through their backyard. And um, I think that the other, the other aspect of this was the lack of signage because it's really hard to identify. So after hearing your proposal, it seems to me that this would be a, a much better plan to have a, an improved trail to have adequate signage, to have proper uh, markings, you know, shrubbery and whatever, what have you, foot rail fence. In other words, it would be an obvious trail and it would be evident to the public, as well as the fact that um, there would be adequate parking across the street that does belong to the town. And I, and I don't think that uh, whoever owns that ice cream stand would really have a problem with that. There's a lot of room. Um, maybe they would, but regardless, it, I, don't think that, I don't think you'd have a lot of parking there. The point of the matter is, is you would have a place to park that would be off of the 77. So in my estimation, this looks like a very good plan. I just want to express that. Councilor Roberts. Thank you. Um, I guess a little history lesson. I go back on the Conservation Commission back into the 80s. Um, and. The original plan had one loop going from Crescent Beach to uh, Fort Williams, and it went up through Stonegate and Canterbury, through Lions Field, down through the Viking, Gullcrest, uh, and then out through this way, and down through the Strawberry Field that Maxwell's currently leases from the state. That's state-owned property. This proposal here clearly moves, and the idea was, uh, with the Green Belt, to keep to the very minimum the amount of tr distance people have to tra traverse town streets and byways. It was to keep it in the woods and on the fields and uh, the, the natural areas. And by moving this, we're talking moving it 280 feet down the uh, Route 77. We're putting people the length of the football field further walking on a paved road by moving the, the green belt to the side. As far as the parking is concerned, the parking is now available to walk over towards the, to the current easement. That easement was not signed on the street as a concession to the neighbors. They didn't want signage put out on Route 77. If the town wanted to go out there tomorrow, they could put a bollard and a marker right there. People can walk down the side of the driveway without even touching the pavement. And there's another ball at the 70 feet in where the road curves off to indicate that it goes straight back from that point. Excuse me, just for a second. I'm sorry to interrupt your flow, but I just wanted to tell Mr. Kennedy and his engineer they could sit down <laughs> if they wanted to. I'm sorry, Jack. Please go on. So we have the, the very same parking available across the street, yet people park on the road um, in the bike lane as often as they do at the, at the ice cream place. Uh, the ice cream store basically owns the property that the building sets on. The parking is in the town right-of-way, and it does belong to the town. The current owner has been very good about allowing people, as far as I know. There was a previous owner that was out there throwing ice creams at people when they tried to park there, even though they were coming to buy, prop to buy ice cream and after they went for their walk. As far as moving the trail over here, uh, they've already, the, the applicant has already indicated that people are using that road now and parking there. And that's with a sign that says, keep out, private way. So if you take that sign down, you're going to encourage even more people to park on that road. The, the ice cream place will be full. They will park over there. I went there on uh, Sunday, uh, 
on Sunday. I beat, I guess, I beat, beat most of you, and I, t I stopped to talk with one of the neighbors, and I had to get out and move my car, my truck, because even though I had pulled to the right, they could not get by me. I had to pull forward and drive on the lawn, so that the, uh, apparently someone going to Young's house could drive by m my truck to get to their residence. That poses an immediate, and if somebody's people are doing that, that poses an immediate problem for emergency vehicles. Does anybody remember Fenway Road on the other side of the pond? We're looking at the exact same issue if we put this walkway down here. For human nature, people are going to park the closest point, particularly if this pole over here, they be back in their cars on, on Golden Ridge Lane. The other issue that I have when I look at that, and there's nobody, and I emphasize nobody in this town that has put more time keeping trails open than I have. And a four to six foot wide trail in this type of growth is going to need monthly maintenance for anybody to pass over it. And if that is not done, that closes up and people clearly are going to have to walk down this road as well as down Route 77. And that is going to be the primary access going down the road without that constant maintenance. Um, so I, I guess I'm not opposed to saying, go ahead, put your money into this, let's take a look at it, see how it works, see what kind of problems we have. But I would be adamantly opposed to giving up the other easement without giving this one here a very good trial as to how well it works, how well it stays clear, and whether or not people are parking and posing a pro causing a problem on Golden Ridge Lane and it, then if it proves, if, if I'm proven right, we want to maintain this access over here and not abandon the one that we have because um, I see this as being a major issue both for walking, for parking, and for emergency vehicles, the, the whole gamut of issues that we dealt with over on Fenway Road. And no four foot wide path, and it's listed as four feet in here somewhere, is going to stay open in that kind of... Uh, an environment, I guarantee it. If I could just clarify for the record, the, the motion that's currently on the table is only to accept the new one, not not abandon the old one right. at this point. Just I just want the, the applicant, I guess, to be aware, they could put a lot of money into this to show us that it would or would not work. And if it doesn't work, that's money that they put down the drain, literally, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm more than willing to have them spend their money to do this, but it's at, their, it's at your risk if you do that, because if this grows in and people are parking on the road and it's, we're getting complaints from the chapmans or from the emergency personnel, you've sunk a ton of money into doing this pathway here, only for us to find out it doesn't work and we want to hang on to the one we got that we know does work. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Would you like to make a comment, sir? Actually, I don't think that. I'm used to planning boards where I do that back and forth. I, I just wanted to bring up a, a couple of very minor points relative to Mr. Roberts' comments. Um, and this is not a rebuttal. It's more of a, uh, I live in Cape Elizabeth, and I run on the Greenbelt Trail as much, or, or in some cases a lot more than many other people. Um, and I certainly appreciate the, uh, all the effort uh, that goes into uh, the Conservation Commission maintaining these trails. Um, I'm part of that. Um, I've gone out you know, quite a number of times when they've done that as well. Point being is that we've been much more involved with uh, providing these stream crossings where none were provided before, where it was very, very natural. Uh, the more people that use a trail, the less problem we have with crawling over. Um, and, and I understand what you're saying. You know, every once in a while it might behoove somebody to take a little nippers along with them or something. But generally speaking, the more people that use a trail, the less problems you're going to have with that, the more open it's going to stay. Um, if somebody doesn't use the trail, well, you know, this is what we're trying to avoid right now is to have people who are not using the trail because of its position, regardless of why it was done that way or why it, was, why it wasn't. Right now, I think this is a much better way to be able to provide access, proper signage, direction, everything. And as far as the parking is concerned, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think the bottom line is people are going to park wherever they want to park. Uh, by putting the trail in this particular section, I think we're trying to encourage them to park immediately across the, well, they can get to park wherever they want to, and hopefully they'll leave their cars at home and walk. But for those of us who, uh, who want to drive to a certain portion of the trail, 
if we do see an area that is uh, more open and obviously a little bit more, even through uh, the innuendo, as it were, open parking to be able to have me get out of my car and start walking on the trail, I think that's going to be more conducive than it is walking down, albeit only the length of the football field, but walking down 77 to be able to access the trail and further walking down some of the driveway. Um, it's not meant as a rebuttal, just as a, as a comment uh, toward that end as somebody who uses these trails a lot. And uh, having worked extensively with the staff and with the planning board and the conservation on this, uh, it is our request that we just uh, receive, I would say, tacit approval to be able to go ahead with this, as Mr. McGovern had mentioned, uh, knowing full well that we do not expect an extinguishment of the trail that's already there until, as Mr. Roberts had mentioned, this one is up and actually reviewed by the town engineer or other members of the staff or whomever wants to get involved and said, yes, this meets the letter of the plan the way it was approved by the town. Thank you. Council Knowles. Two quick questions. <clears throat> the current trail, where it intersects with Route 77, from there, where is the trail going across 77? Is it right there? Is it up the street? Is it uh, actually, Mr. Roberts can probably answer that better than I. I'm not aware of a connecting trail. That's is there a connecting the trail there? Or? We do not currently have an easement but the state owns the parcel that Ken Maxwell currently has a strawberry field on in Route 77. So that is state-owned land that goes that right down to the beach, and the Greenbelt plan shows that as being one of the links to the overall Greenbelt from Crescent Beach to Fort Williams Park. Okay, that was my first question. And actually, I have three questions. Next question, I'm pretty familiar with that strip of road across from the ice cream stand and it's pretty thick along the edge of the, the road uh, as far as walking from Golden Ridge Lane over to where the uh, that must be the Hagman's driveway so yes this, this section right in here um, any provision for either you or the town cleaning up that side of the road to make it safer for people to to walk down that side of the road. I don't know what you're talking about, Michael. We have a we have a bikeway there along the side of the road. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the should be. It's still. I mean, you, yeah, you have the bikeway. It's not wood chip green belt, but uh, uh, that was my next question because I it's, it's pretty thick. You know, the second you step off the pavement, even it's even hard to fit a political sign there. It's that thick. So, you know. uh, the other, the other question was, okay, if you put the easement in, and if, if you put the trail in, and people occasionally still walk down Golden Ridge Lane instead of ten feet to the left on the easement. Uh, how you going to how, how do you respond to that now and how do you foresee responding to that in the future probably the same way we do now we just let them go maybe encourage them that there's a new trail over there they'll see the wood chips hopefully they'll figure it out that instead of walking down the road might be a little better on the path that we create and your other question I think the new trail is going to come out pretty close to diagonal to where the parking is going to be Right. I don't think they're going to have to come up with 77 much. I don't think that the, the heavy brush you're talking about here is going to be much of an issue because it's pretty much kitty corner. So you're just going to cross the road and go right into the trail. No, Mike meant going down towards Crescent Beach again. I was thinking if you were traveling from Crescent Beach towards the pond or from oh, the pond yeah. towards Crescent Beach, either the right-hand side or the other side of the road, you gotta you got to go down. Now, there's no parking across from the Hagman's driveway now, right now, is there? It's just at the ice cream stand. Is that correct? There's, there's right in, in the immediate vicinity of the Hagman's driveway, there's a sign posted, no parking within so many feet of the driveway. There's the areas of this land that are within the, the BA zone that Maureen went over earlier this evening. Within the BA zone, there is no parking in the roadway, so there's no parking in the roadway by the ice cream stand, uh, but there is parking in the area of the road uh, along the bikeway where there is no uh, VA zone, according to a long debate the council had a few years ago. Councilor Bassett. 
Um, I have a question for Mr. Kennedy, and it's really a follow-up on Council Roberts' comments. But what, and you may have addressed this before, and I sort of missed it in passing, but what is the benefit to you or your personal interest in seeing the existing easement extinguished? Uh, there's two right now. It would be opening up this lot and getting the easement out of the middle of it would be the first. And the second would be to just maybe discourage a few people to stop using the road and parking in it and move them to the path. Because right now, nobody uses the trail the way it is right now. Let's face it. Everybody comes down the road, down the driveway, takes a hard left, goes in and around. And the first part of your answer, the lot, is that lot A? Yes. Um, that is a developable lot? Yes. That is not currently developed? No. And it is a developable lot even with the trail the way it is now. So it would benefit to move it for everybody if it ever got built on to have the trail out of the way now instead of later. Could you just take your finger and sort of draw around? I'm not sure where the boundaries of lot A are Seven on this map. Lot A starts at our proposed easement for the Greenbelt comes up this way, jogs down here a little bit, comes out basically like this and then down. Most of this section right here is a low-level wetland, RP2 wetland. This is the developed, it was found in the answer just a little bit. This is the, uh, the dominant house site um, for, a, uh, for the lot that's back here. And uh, as Jeff had mentioned, you know, if, if this doesn't go away, it's, the sun's still going to come up tomorrow. But this is still a developable lot with all the required minimum frontage and meets all the other criteria. The point being, given what the mill property values are in Cape Elizabeth, there's going to be a house here someday, um, relatively soon, possibly. And where would that, where would the driveway for that house come <laughs> off of? Yeah, where the driveway? How would you access that lot? Ostensibly, it would come off from of Golden uh, Ridge. either right here or probably not the turnout, probably right in this section. So it would come right across here and down here. Okay. So the current easement, if if indeed there are house built in where he said was the prime spot and the driveway went over from Golden Ridge to that, the current easement would be crossing over their driveway. Both easements would be crossing over the driveway. That's okay. correct. That's correct. Okay. If it were coming over the current easement, then um, the easement would be, the, excuse me, the proposed easement right here, again, would be the, the trail surface of the driveway that was standing. That would be built up with the, uh, uh, the shrubbery and the uh, trees planted on either side of that relative to a driveway that would literally come right down the middle of what is now basically an open field of grass lawn uh, that would cross right through here and, and uh, to the house that would be up on the side. Thank you. Councilor Backer, did you want to follow up? Um, I guess the only follow up I would have would be directed to either um, of the members of the Conservation Commission that are here. Just having heard the whole discussion that we've had presented to us whether the Conservation Commission is satisfied that the, I guess the December 16, 2003 approved planning board plan accommodates all of the concerns of the commission. Um. I was unaware until tonight that the town had actually stopped Kennedy's from, um, from developing that trail. So I think some of my remarks earlier may have been inappropriate because of my lack of knowledge of the performance one. I wish I had known that. Um, however, uh, even in saying that, uh, we still would want to be assured that the, uh, that the developer would be in compliance with the uh, agreement they had with the planning board that that trail uh, will be built as specified. That's a, that's a very, very critical area. Um, and we want to make sure that that is uh, user-friendly for the residents of Cape Elizabeth. So we, we just urge that whatever the council does, that, the, that you do make sure that they do comply with the, with the existing agreements with the planning board. And that's all we're really concerned about. And any, 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 and I, I just hope the Kennedys and Mr. Fisher did not take any offense by my uh, probably overly strong statements, the lack of development there because they were unable to do so. So I would apologize for that. 
I, I, I do hope that the council does uh, take this very seriously and, and, and enforce it, make sure that the trail was built according to specifications. Thank you. And I just want to make sure that I'm clear on this. When you talk about making sure that the trail is built according to specification and or the design as presented to the planning board, that those specifications and that design is in fact incorporated into the plan as approved by the planning board or not? Yes. That's my understanding too. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Fritz. I still didn't see anything in the, the material that we got, the design of the, of the pedestrian easement that talked about boardwalk um, over that very wet area. I mean, you can put in six inches of gravel and six inches of wood chips in the area I saw today, and that's not, it's not going to be dry. It, there needs to be something else in there. And I, I think there's some more culverts going in too. That's where the culvert needs to be extended. That we're talking about. You Would you be it? putting a culvert underneath the road and? No, it's already speaking. underneath the road. It needs to be extended past that to include the trail. That's why it's wet. It's draining into the. It's draining into the way the path is going to go now. Once we extend it, it'll put it on farther and it will not be on the path. But I thought I heard you saying that a culvert weren't large enough and that was one of the reasons it that just it was now aren't long enough for like some of them are full of i think you said they weren't long enough right meaning, meaning they need to be extended they need for to be as extended long to dry that out this is also being uh, these are two projects that are basically melded into one the road itself is also being redone to a certain standard uh, this is also as uh, i think uh, councilman backer mentioned we are held to the standard of what the planning board approved uh, in order to be able to get the, the proposed extinguishment of this easement relative to this one. Everything that has been, uh, that we have designed uh, based on the Kennedy's uh, approval uh, that has been submitted to the board through the Conservation Commission and reviewed by the town's engineer and the staff, we have to, all that has been approved, we have to adhere to that. Um, otherwise, we won't be back to ask for anything. We wouldn't be here this evening. That's just the standard that we have to adhere to at all times as far as construction from the design. Mm -hmm. To answer your, your specific question, Chris, about uh, uh, the construction of the drainage that's there right now, one of the big problems, one of the reasons why you have the drainage problem, not only because we've got a, a, a well, not an exceptionally wet year, but a very wet year relative to the past year, is that these improvements haven't yet been done. This is the way it is actually right now, which is exacerbating an, an existing problem. When these culverts are in, and I, I do stand corrected, I think, uh, regarding the, uh, the boardwalk. I think there, we were talking about a uh, 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 walk coming straight across here, and there is a, a, a man-made uh, drainage ditch that's right over in this section. Uh, culverts are the best way to actually to, to cross that. If the, uh, the commission or, uh, or the case of the staff, principally the Conservation Commission, uh, would request a boardwalk, that's fine with us. Uh, but right now, everything is to be culverted, which is much more long-term as far as that's concerned. Uh, and again, as far as that drainage is concerned, this will be, uh, assuming that all the construction follows the design, will actually elevate this and will provide a drier environment, a higher environment, uh, in which to walk through a more natural wood-like setting, and it does now. Councilor Roberts? I'll make this my last comment, I guess, but I'm not necessarily opposed to the town accepting this easement, per se. My concern is that we know what we have and before we give that up we really need to give this one after they develop it a chance to see what happens in there and whether my concerns are valid or not so and it sounds like what we're being asked to do is the minute the engineer certifies that this is has met their specs that in order we accept this and we extinguish we extinguish the other one and that's where I have the problem. I would rather keep both of them at least short term till we know for a fact that this one is indeed meeting our expectations and we're not winding up with less than we currently have. And so if, if the two of them have to be done at the same time, I will vote against it. If we can hope, if it can be held off so that we can accept, take a look at this 
uh, and accept it or, or can accept it on a uh, experiment or trial basis or whatever. And uh, while we hold on to our other easements, I'd be willing to do that, but not extinguish one without having a good working knowledge of how this behaves itself and how it's cleared and taken care of. Councilman. I believe that the motion that Councillor Lynch made, which I seconded, does just that. Simply to accept the current proposed easement, it does not abandon the prior, the current and existing easement or, or Greenbelt Trail. And if I'm incorrect, I'm sure the town clerk will let me know. I, I believe that you are correct, but I would like to ask Mr. Kennedy if he's interested in doing that, um, because what is proposed is my understanding is that Mr. Kennedy would want to uh, extinguish the other easement in exchange for building this new easement. So I'm not sure Mr. Kennedy is going to be interested in this, and I'd just like to hear from him on that. No, I would really like to, when this is signed off by the town engineer, make the swap and do it. I mean, so who maintains the Greenbelt Trails now in town? They must all grow older. This wouldn't be different than any other one, I would think. Except that right now, we have doesn't do that, and it's easy just to mow it. There's no trails that have to be cut back oh. in town? Uh, absolutely. I take care of golf first all the time. <laughs> right. So I don't think it's any different than what we have existing now in town. Uh, we're trying to make it more user-friendly for people in town to use, and I feel I'm, I'm giving up quite a bit doing all this and spending a, a lot of money to get it done to say, well, thanks, we don't really like it. You're stuck with it. I don't know. I'm just not comfortable with that. So uh, it just to, I just want to be sure and, and it's absolutely imperative that we understand what your interests are in this um, for us to vote properly. You are not interested in supporting the motion as it currently stands from Councillor Lynch, which was to just accept, uh, accept the transfer of the, the new proposed easement. You want to make it contingent upon um, oh, I mean, what, when what the new one is accepted. Are you waiting one or two years? Are you talking six months? How long are you talking before you decide to do it, I guess, is my question. Thank you. Councilor Lynch. Um, I'm no longer interested in my motion. Um, At all? The, no. No. Oh. <laughs> no. I'm sorry. Um, for the reason that it does um, not address the issue of abandoning the other um, Section. So I would like to withdraw my motion so that I could put forth a new motion that would make clear an order for abandonment as well as acceptance. Okay. You want to make that motion? Is that all I have to do? I don't need a. Do I thought the seconder needed to. Oh, does the seconder? I'll withdraw my second. Marianne, I, I think it really goes back to pretty close to what you're saying is the original draft motion. Yes. Yeah. As, yeah. pr as printed here? Yes. Yeah. So that, so what you are, um, what I would move, what I would move is that we um, authorize the town manager to accept um, the relocation of the green belt um, between the Powell and Hagman properties by um, accepting the um, proposed greenbelt along Golden Ridge Lane and provided that um, it meets and it does have the certification of the town engineer that it meets all of the requirements of a planning board that at that point, and at that point only, the town manager would be authorized to then um, um, execute any documents necessary to abandon the section of the green belt between the Powell and the Hagman property. Thank you. So I think it is basically, I'm moving <laughs> what you've said with just an emphasis on abandonment only when you receive that. And yeah. You said everything that the planning board required, so I assume you're requiring both the certification of the town engineer as well as some indication from the Conservation Commission to me that they have also 
agree to it because that was part of the planning board's original I think that would be board, yes uh, if that's proposal. what the planning board originally stated I think that would be okay. important just want to clarify that so if I could just paraphrase make sure I understand it you're um, moving that the green belt be moved um, from to that we accept the um, the new uh, easement along Golden Ridge Lane, and when when it is completely complete and up to specs and authorized and everything like that, and once the Conservation Commission has signed off on it, um, if, yeah, if that's part of what the Planning Board stated, is that part what it? Part yeah, they did. They they said the Conservation Commission. I in my draft, I substituted the town engineer because I think the town engineer is more experienced and is, is less subjective, not no, no criticism of the Conservation Commission intended. Okay. And when all the requirements are met, then the we would we would abandon the other one. The the current one along the Hagway. Right. Okay. That's the motion. Is there a second? I second that motion. Okay. So now we have the new motion and the new second. Is there further discussion? Councillor Fritz. Um, I think this is such an important uh, connection um, into Great Pond um, that I, I really tend to agree with Councillor Roberts that I want to see how this one would work before actually abandoning. Um, I, I know the current situation isn't ideal because it is it goes across the driveway. I notice there is a sign that's um, much more obvious out near the road than it used to be. Um, I walked the trail today. Um, it really is dry. It is a huge good trail. Um, unfortunately, the, the driveway that is there, that was done by the, the owner of the property. Um, there are trees that have been planted over it, which I don't think we should have allowed, which make it, I mean, there could be more of a buffer than um, than there is, so that you feel more comfortable. But um, we do have that access, and we want to make sure that it's used and that people aren't parking on a private road, which is what this would be. Um, so I want to see that it works. But I also have some concern that actually this trail proposal would be more expensive for the town to maintain the street. Um, there really isn't much expense now. Um, so I, I would agree with Council Rogers and be opposed to this motion because it would abandon immediately. Okay. The manager would like yeah, to I, just, clarify something? Just clarify two points. There's been a couple of references to folks driving on Golden Ridge Lane and parking for the purpose of the Green Belt. I, I want to make sure everyone is clear, and particularly the public who, who might have some expectation if the council took an action that they could drive down there and park there. This easement only permits a pedestrian right of way over the areas described. No motorized self propelled vehicles or snowmobiles of any kind shall be permitted to use it. It's intended for pedestrian foot traffic only, except that from this limitation of restriction are official government vehicles for the purpose of performing repair and maintenance public safety or other proper public service. Nowhere is the community in this easement or the townspeople given, being given a right to drive down Golden Ridge Lane. Uh, so any parking would still have to be elsewhere. Uh, there just simply is no grant of, of, of motorized access except for government vehicles. The second, and you know, I hear it all the time, about the Hagdens never should have built their driveway. Uh, and, and, and I just, I think the Hagdens get a bad rap on this. Uh, the easement that is, is currently existing is, is simply an easement. It's not owned by the town. The town's rights are simply list, limited to pedestrian access. The town, is in no way, under the grant of the easement that we received from the Sprague Corporation, can could prohibit them from granting any right to the Hagman. Which is what, which is essentially what they did. They gave the rights to the Hagman to put their driveway in. 
that was within their right to do. You know, people may not like it, it's uncomfortable. You know, we deal with the same situation with this one. Uh, you know, if the same thing with lot A. Does Craig want to give a right over that easement, or maybe there already is something to title for, for vehicles to cross over it, uh, or a driveway, they can do that. But I just want to point that out, because the Hagman, I keep hearing over and over, they never should have put their driveway there. They were well within their, their legal right to do so. Thank you. The easement was part of the subdivision approval, though, not part of the Sprague easement. But, but the, the Sprague gave us an easement to pass over there as part of the Sprague subdivision, not as part of the Ottawa Spring subdivision, which this, which this one originally was. Uh, you know, there's two, there's two separate approvals. And we, we only have the rights that the Sprague gave us. You know, it's the same thing happened on Lyons Field recently when Bill and Al came in, and you know, it came in that he had the rights to go in the back end. We weren't too thrilled about giving the right for a driveway all over Lyons Field, but that was the legal right, and as a result, they were able to build the two houses back there, one or two houses, whatever they are, and they have taken the right to do that. You know, we only have those rights that are granted to us, and the the property in that's being held in fee maintains certain rights with all these easements unless they specifically waive them to us and then we would need to be a party to it. You know, like, you know, we just got other reasons all the time. There's another one pending with Fort William. And, you know, you need to really read these things carefully because what's granted is granted and what isn't is. And beyond that, it becomes subject to other parties and negotiation. Councilor Moore. Are we ready to vote? Are there any, is there any further discussion? I think everybody on this, I've got a crick on my neck this way, so I think everybody on this side has had their say. Anybody else down here want to say anything? I guess I'd just like to respond to um, Carol's comment about wanting to know and, and the council being able to um, assure itself that everything's done the right way. Um, in an ideal world, maybe that would work. My concern with that is I've heard the developer say it can't happen that way. He's got one easement. He wants to move it to another spot. He's willing to do that, but he's looking for abandonment. Um, I have confidence that the town manager has heard the discussion tonight and realizes how important it is through the council that it be done right. So I have confidence in the town manager, the town engineer, and the conservation commission. Um, the current situation, everyone says, is not a good one. So um, uh, I'm, I'm willing to, to say, and I think it's important to say, we don't need to see this again. We've got some very competent people who can now make sure, assuming we vote to, um, relocate. We heard a lot of competent people who will be making sure that all eyes have been dotted and the T's crossed. So yeah. I just wanted to add that. Okay. Anybody else on Councilor Beck? I value the Conservation Commission's input on judgment calls on how the Greenbelt Trail should be run and maintained. And if they support this move you know, with the understandable conditions that have been imposed by the planning board. Um, I'm fine with it. And I don't think it's realistic to expect the Kennedys to build this trail with some undefined amorphous timeline for when the town may or may not accept it in some final form and then agree to abandon or extinguish the existing easement. So I'm in favor of the motion. Anything? Council Moore? No? Then let's move to questions. The motion before us, just to remind us, is essentially the same one that we see printed out here as item number 172, um, 0405. So all in favor of the motion from Councillor Lynch? Four. Opposed? Three. Motion passes. I want to thank everyone for their patience. It's a close issue and uh, very strong feelings on both sides. And I'm 
sure that the Kennedys will do a good job with the, the new easement, and I wish them well. Thank you. Thank you. Two years to go and go over this way. There will be no trails. I guarantee you. And the back, they told you so. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. Yes, thank you, Maureen. I know it's been a long evening. Okay. Hopefully we can zip along quickly on the rest of these. Item number 173, use of Fort Williams Park for Family Fun Day, June 18th. Rain date, June 25th. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? It, 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 I think it's back. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so all in favor? 6-0. Um, Councilor Roberts had to step out. Is that? Um, Item number 174, use of Fort Williams Park for Pond Cove Field Days on June 6th through 9th, 2005, from 9 a.m. to 11.15 a.m. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? 6-0. Thank you. That was 6-0, yes. Okay. Item number 175 has to do with use of $1,200 in the Marion Chase Fund for the library. Mr. McGovern? Yeah, uh, this came forward from the library. I recommend its approval. And I, I hope that in the future, and I know they will, uh, there'll, there'll be larger requests coming in uh, that use up uh, more of these, these very generous donations from uh, the Chase family. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? 6-0, yes. Thank you. And I want to echo the manager's comments that we really appreciate the generosity of those who have given this gift to the library will be put, put to very good use. I might add, Jerry Sherman today said that Chase's, with their gifts and some matching funds to Georgia Pacific, have given uh, now a quake with, with the pending one from Georgia Pacific to $100,000. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay, item number 176. There is no, no item... Uh, no attachments on this one, but it has to do with the proposed finance committee revision for the fiscal year 05. That's the current year's school budget. Councillor Backer, would you like to make a motion? Um, sure. I move that we amend the fiscal year 2005 school budget to provide for total expenditures of $16,605,861. And total revenues of $2,232,163. Um, in the amount of $14,373,698 to be raised from taxation. And just by way of explanation, this uh, is uh, being done simply to add $50,000 to both revenues and expenditures on the school side to reflect um, action of the school board uh, or the school department after the fiscal year 2005 budget was approved. And the amount from taxation is not changed, just and for anybody yeah. who's wondering. Okay, I'm sorry. Was there a second? I was seconding it. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Yes. Councilor Moore. Just for the public's knowledge of uh, what transpired there, uh, at the end of the last budget season, the uh, school board decided that it needed to raise some additional funds uh, for the athletic department. They instituted a fee structure, about $50,000 worth of fees, to cover those expenditures. Uh, so essentially what, what they did was um, raise both expenditures and revenues at the same time 
although at the time uh, they did not consult the council and many of us felt they should have uh, to make this year's budget process flow in line we discussed that and decided that it was better to amend last year's budget it, since it made no effect to taxes uh, but I do want to state for the record that I am as, as big a supporter of the schools as I am I am opposed to the ever increasing of these athletic fees and I, I find that we're on the slippery slope there where these fees can continue to grow um, to the point where they become burdensome on individual families. Thank you. Is there further discussion on this item? Hearing none, all in favor? Six, it's unanimous. Sorry. Um, item number 177 or 405, proposed abatement of personal property taxes. Ms. Lane, do you need to introduce this? Or does council want to get an introduction to this? No? Do I hear a motion? <laughs> Somebody I'm, make a motion? I'll make a motion. I move um, to abate uh, that the council abate um, $338.52 in FY 2002 personal property tax and $358.18 in FY 2003 personal property taxes on unpaid in unpaid taxes from 517 Ocean House Road um, as the previous owner of the Cape Variety did not pay the personal property tax. Um, and I guess I further move to abate $1.42 in FY 2004 personal property tax taxes assessed to John F. Hayes, previous owner of 249 Ocean House Road. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Six, it's unanimous. Item number 178, propo proposed revisions to the return check policy. We have um, a revised policy in front of us. Uh, I presume everybody's looked at it. I know Ms. Lane has worked on it, and I believe Councillor Backer has put his skills to work on this one too, do a little revising. Um, is there anyone who needs to ask questions or hear revisions? I mean, hear introductions? Okay, do I hear a motion? I make a motion that we accept the proposed revision to the return check policy as put forth by the uh, System town manager. Second. Would it actually be approved by the new trustee? Will you accept that as a friendly amendment? Absolutely. And the second, Geralto? What was the amendment? Um, to use the word approve, not accept the policy, to approve oh. the policy. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's been slightly amended, it's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? I, I just want to make it clear that the draft as presented to us is, seems to be in a red line form showing some additions. This is not, this is not a description of the change from the version that came before us a month ago. Well, what is shown on here with a few underlines is really the last draft of a few rounds of revision. This is substantially revised from what came before us a month ago, just so everybody's clear on that, that if they're looking and thinking that these underlinings are the only changes, there are quite a bit, there are quite a few other changes. But this is the final. But this is the final draft, yes. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Council Lynch. I just wanted to thank David for um, taking this on and working on it. Appreciate his personal involvement. Yes, and both he and Ms. Lane worked well, a yeah. lot. In yes. Thanks to I Deborah thank Lane for helping with it. Uh, and Deborah too, but Deborah gets paid to do it, and David is not getting paid to do it. And he, he does it for fun. 
Oh, but I do. Does it get paid back? <laughs> he does get paid for it, I just not by us. I get parking space every time I come <laughs> to meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Even a late night parking space. Okay, um, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Six, it's unanimous. Thank you. Um, item number 179, proposed change to the zoning board bylaws. Mr. McGovern? Yeah, the, um, this came from the zoning board. They had, a, they had a discussion, they had a vote to change the title of Secretary to Vice Chair. Looking at it, it ties into the zoning ordinance. It also ties into the rules and regulations. And the rules and regulations, there's all sorts of other language that needs to be changed. And their rules and regulations can only be changed by the council with a recommendation from them. So I, I recommend this to refer it back to them to, to uh, get it in order for council consideration. So moved. Is there a second? I second it. It's been moved and seconded. Councilor Fritz? The staff would be happy to help them through that process, but it, it's just not in order. Thank you, Councillor Fritz. I forget, but and I didn't look it up. But uh, I, as the planning board, do they have a similar chair, secretary? I mean, are there other boards that the wording needs to be changed? So we do it all at once. I, I believe, if I might, Madam Chairman, I, I think you're correct. I think the planning board has the same situation, uh, but we haven't looked at their documents. And again, you know, it's encouraging them to propose it because their rules and regulations can't be amended by the amended by the council without their recommendation. But I mean, I'd rather do it all at once than yes. have everybody be consistent if we're going to do it. Could we ask the manager or whoever he designates yeah, to ask them if they? all you know the, we'll the various boards to see if they want to do it because it would be more cost effective if nothing else to just change to lump as many changes together in one change but we'll work for an omnibus package <laughs> <laughs> i mean in effect i don't know if they're really a secretary i mean we have a secretary actually taking no. we, we have a paid yeah. secretary yeah. the things you need to be careful with these things is you know there might be some quirk in some state law that says the yeah. secretary unintended shall not notice. Mm -hmm. Unintended you know, it's a, it's a, you know, debt to ban upon some of the statutes today I was shocked at, so you never know what you're going to find. The legislation medals is harmful. Okay. I'm looking forward to this omnibus bill. Okay, it's been <laughs> moved. To, has it been moved? Oh, we're still discussing. I'm sorry. Start discussing then. Councilor Mould. No offense towards the zoning board, but is this really an item worth spending much time on? Is, as our town manager pointed out, we running the risk of bumping into some, you know, unforeseen regulation where we might spend a lot of time and effort on this issue and then have to reverse it? Or should we just kill it now? You know, I, I think you run that risk, but you know, you know, if it's not a real big issue, my deference is always to, is my policy is to show deference to a board. They've asked for it. And they felt strongly about it. I don't know if they felt strongly about it, but I, I would tend to defer to them. But if they don't want to work actively on it, they don't see it's a big deal. They can let it drop. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? So this is to refer it back. To refer to uh, the motion was to refer it back to the zoning board. Okay. All in favor? Seven. Zero. Thank you. It's unanimous. Um, and the next item is item number 180, proposed resolution authorizing the town to do business with Bangor Savings Bank. Mr. McGovern. We would not be moving our major accounts there. This is simply when we go out to bid for certificates of deposit, uh, repurchase agreements, et cetera, we would add this institution to our bank list, to our bank list. Uh, it did have to be the, the high bidder in the case of investment, to offer the best rate. We're keeping our checking accounts and all that with uh, the current institution. Mm -hmm. Do 
destroyed. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. So moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. We are now at the second portion of our meeting where we have an opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on the agenda. If there's any citizen who would like to come forward, now's your chance. Seeing no one out in the audience other than one lonely town employee. Who is a citizen? Perhaps we, perhaps we should add a phone in line. <laughs> no, I think, I don't think I'd be in favor of that. We should have a late night talk show going. Um, we will move on to adjournment. And after we adjourn, I just would like to have us huddle for our calendars just for a moment to make sure we have these dates on our calendars. But do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. And moved and seconded. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. And uh, we have.